Which figure from the Gospels was a locksmith? Zacchaeus. Get it? Zacchaeus. Huh. Uh, all right. Um, maybe one more. How do we know how much money St. Peter had? We examine his net worth. Get it? Because he was a fisherman. Net worth. Yes. And that, sixth grade, is how you do gospel jokes. All right. Uh, why is John... Oh, we're doing questions for Passion Narrative Study Guide. So we're going to go through all 11 questions. Number one, why is John's gospel different from the other gospels? Two reasons. First reason, John's gospel was written after the synoptic gospels. So he has a different purpose and intent for writing his gospels. He um, emphasizes certain things. Uh, that are present in the other Gospels. He also leaves out a lot of details that are present in the other Gospels, maybe because um, he thinks the other Gospels covered them well. Maybe he thinks they're not as important as the other Gospel writers did. Uh, another thing John's Gospel does is he includes uh, miracles and details and explanations of things that are not present in the other Gospels. So it's kind of like John is filling in the gaps from the other three Gospels, all right? So that's number one. Number two, John's Gospel is different because he likes to emphasize Christ's divinity, especially when it comes to the Passion narrative. So John's Passion narrative doesn't include Simon of Cyrene, for example. Why is this? Because likely it's because uh, John wanted to show that Jesus was in control of the situation the whole time. All right. Number two, how do we know that Luke's version of the trial before the Sanhedrin was illegal, or was legal? Uh, how did this compare to the illegal versions? So Luke's version of the trial happens during the daytime. Because it happens during the daytime, it's out in the open, it's public, there are crowds there. Um, you would not have an illegal trial during the daytime in front of a really big crowd. In the other Gospels, the trial happens at night, right? A night trial is always going to be illegal because uh, night trials are secret, right? They can't be done in front of a big crowd that's gathered. Uh, we also know in the other Gospels that the trial is illegal because the witnesses contradict each other, right? That's a big deal. Um... Let's see. Number three, why are Jesus' followers upset when the woman pours expensive ointment over his head? Why does Jesus rebuke them? They're upset because they know that this jar of ointment or perfume or whatever it is that this woman pours over Jesus' head, you know, flows down his body, it gets in his clothes, it disappears into the floor or the dirt. They know how expensive it is, right? It's probably equivalent to about a one-year salary for an average laborer in ancient Judea. It's a lot of money that uh, the apostles and some of the disciples think probably would have been better spent if the woman had maybe used some of it on Jesus, because Jesus is special. Uh, but uh, if she wanted to really show that she was a follower of Jesus, they think she should have sold it and given the money to the poor, right? Uh, of course, Jesus rebukes them for thinking this way. He says they're wrong to think this way. He says the woman did the right thing. Why is this? Uh, number one, because the woman's actions show um, that Jesus, the significance of what's about to happen to Jesus, right? He's being anointed because he's going to be part of a sacrifice, Right? He's going to sacrifice himself on the cross. Um, Jesus also rebukes them because there's nothing wrong with what she did. Right, It's impossible to waste your resources or waste your money when you're using it to glorify God. Right, So it would have been fine if the woman used some of it 
to anoint Jesus and sold the rest of it and gave it to the poor. There would have been nothing wrong with that. But Jesus is saying there's nothing wrong with what she did the way she did it. Right? So you can use all of your wealth, all of your resources to glorify God in whatever way that your conscience tells you to. And this woman's conscience was telling her to use the entire jar of ointment on Jesus um, to anoint him, right? That doesn't mean she doesn't care about the poor. Doesn't mean she's being wasteful, right? Okay, um, what three important events does Luke's narrative institution contain? Well, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So that establishes two things. Number one, it establishes the priesthood because Jesus is um, performing a liturgy that involves uh, transubstantiation, which only a priest could do. Right? So he's giving authority to his apostles. To He's giving them the power, the divine supernatural power, to uh, transubstantiate, which is only something a priest can do. Uh, which brings me to the second thing that it establishes. Uh, the narrative of institution establishes the mass, right? So the priesthood, the mass. Um, <coughs> uh, so yes, the, the Passover meal um, is not just a meal, right? It was a Jewish liturgy. It involved a lot of ritual and prayer. But when Jesus performed, uh, when he led the Passover meal, uh, the Passover's religious significance ended and was replaced or superseded by the Mass. So as Catholics, we are not supposed to celebrate uh, Passover liturgies, right? Um, we, we celebrate the Mass because the Passover liturgy was superseded by the Mass. Passover liturgy is something that Jews celebrate, and Jews, of course, reject the idea of the Trinity and Christ is the Messiah and all of that. The third important event uh, that Luke's narrative of institution establishes is the establishment of the Eucharist, of course. <clears throat> all right, next one. How is the way that Peter responds to denying Jesus different than the way that Judas responds? Well, both Peter and Judas commit terrible sins against Christ Peter, of course, denies Christ three times, which is a kind of betrayal. And Judas directly betrays Christ by handing him over to the Sanhedrin, by having them arrested. Right? Um, both men initially respond uh, to realizing the gravity of their sin um, by repenting. Right? Uh, but... Um, Judas's repentance is shallow and unfruitful, right? It's sterile repentance uh, because it does not contain hope in the mercy of God, right? So when Peter repents, Peter weeps and he doesn't despair, right? It takes Peter a very long time to get to the point where he is a saint again, right? Um, remember, Peter goes into hiding. Peter isn't present at the foot of the cross, and then he goes into hiding until Pentecost, right? But Peter does repent, and he doesn't give in to despair. He, he maintains hope in the mercy of God, right? And then, of course, um, on Pentecost, He's given the grace to lead the church. And then we see the, the New Testament, St. Peter, of Acts of the Apostles and of the Epistles of St. Peter, you know, the evangelist. He becomes this great saint. Judas, on the other hand, betrays Jesus. He kind of sort of tries to make it right by saying, I betrayed innocent blood. He tries to give the money back. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, reject this. They say, basically, we don't care. He says, what, what is that to us? Right? And this causes Judas to despair. Right? So Judas commits basically one sin in betraying Christ and then a follow-up sin in 
despairing, right? Despairing of the mercy of God. And his despair is so intense, it leads him to create, to con commit um, one of the ultimate grave sins, which is suicide. All right. Number six, what supernatural events happen when Jesus dies? There are three things. Number one, the temple veil tears from top to bottom. Remember the fact that it tears from top to bottom tells us it was a supernatural event. Number two, darkness covers the land. Uh, this could be an eclipse, uh, but the Gospels aren't explicit about that. Um, so it's likely a supernatural event. Number three, uh, John's Gospel tells us the dead come out of their tombs and they go into the city. We're not really sure what that means, but it is definitely supernatural because dead people don't rise. Um, so remember, there's different interpretations of what that could mean. It'd be a good idea for you to review that. The fourth one might be supernatural and it might not. We're not really sure, uh, but there's an earthquake when Jesus is crucified and dies. Um, and it's probably a very strong earthquake. Now, there's nothing supernatural about an earthquake happening. Earthquakes happen all the time. But given the timing, right, it's not a coincidence that the earthquake happened at this moment. So that's why we say it's a supernatural event, right? Not because it's an earthquake, but because of the timing. Number seven, why don't the soldiers break Jesus' legs? Uh, they don't break his legs because they believe he's already dead, right? Breaking someone's legs is very difficult. It requires a lot of upper body strength. Um, so they're supposed to break the legs of all the crucified Jews because it's the Sabbath and the Jews will get very, very upset if any, any Jewish person is still alive on the cross. When the sun goes down, that's when the Sabbath starts. So they have to make sure all the Jewish people they crucified that day are dead. So that's why they go around breaking their legs because if the legs are broken, then they can't support themselves on the cross and they... Uh, asphyxiate themselves very quickly and die. Uh, they don't break Jesus' legs because by the time they get to Jesus, they see he's already dead. So to make sure he's dead, they pierce his side. They stick a spear through his side and it goes all the way through and punctures his heart right, to make sure he's dead and blood and water comes out. What connection does this have to the Paschal Lamb? Um, so remember, the Paschal lamb is not supposed to have any broken bones. If you were a Jewish person and you're sacrificing a lamb for the Passover, <coughs> um, the lamb was not supposed to have any blemishes or any broken bones at all. Jesus, of course, is the Paschal lamb. Um, it's not literally a lamb, but uh, he is a sacrifice um, for the salvation of the world. Just like the Paschal lamb is a sacrifice whose blood saves the Jews from, their, from the angel of death. Um, what other details show the connection between Jesus and the Paschal lamb? Well, there's a few things. So we have the no broken bones thing. Uh, we have the fact that during Jesus' trial, Jesus remains silent, right, to cast himself or to show that he is innocent, just like a lamb. Um, and then a third detail, I want to get this right, is that... Uh, uh, the sixth hour... Um, so Jesus is going to be crucified at the sixth hour. John points this out. The sixth hour is the moment when the Jews would sacrifice the lamb for the Passover feast. So at the beginning of Jesus' crucifixion, it just coincides with the moment when Jews all over Israel, all over Judea, were sacrificing, were slaughtering their lambs. Okay, uh, next one. What is the significance of the temple veil tearing? Uh, I kind of already told 
talked about that. Uh, I do need to <coughs> include one more detail though. So remember, the fact that it tears from top to bottom shows that it's a supernatural event because the temple veil was um, a very tall, very thick veil. So it would have been extremely difficult for any human being to climb up the top of the temple veil and then rip it in half or cut it in half or whatever they would have done. <coughs> uh, so the fact that it tears from top to bottom instead of bottom to top shows that it wasn't done by a human being. There's a symbolic significance to it as well. Uh, it shows that it basically marks the end of the need for the Jewish temple, right? Uh, Christ's body, which is a temple, has been destroyed. So likewise, the Jewish temple is no longer needed, right? Um, the old covenant has ended. The new covenant has begun. All right. Number nine, what did the Jews believe about entering the home of a Gentile? Well, they believed that uh, if you did so, you became unclean, right? So remember when the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, bring Jesus to Pilate, they refuse to go into Pilate's home. They stay outside because they don't want to be made unclean. And if you do go into the home of a Gentile, you have to go through a cleansing ritual, which takes seven days, right? And of course, this is at the beginning of the Passover, and they don't want to be out for seven days because they don't want to miss out on the Passover. Number 10, why does Judas betray Jesus? Why did the Jewish leaders want Jesus to be crucified? So different gospel writers provide different reasons why Judas betrayed Jesus. Uh, I guess I'll just go to the slides and, and cover that right now. Um, okay, so according to Luke, for example, uh, Satan enters into Judas. Um, what else? Uh, hold on. I don't want to spitball this answer. I'm, I'm actually looking it up. Um, all right, so number one, Judas betrays Jesus because Satan enters into Judas. So uh, Judas is giving into sin. Satan is almost taking possession. Not that Judas was possessed, but it's like Satan was taking possession of Judas's faculties in order to cause Judas to sin. Uh, Judas, of course, is offered 30 pieces of silver, right? Uh, so the fact that Judas chooses the moment right after the woman who pours the ointment over Jesus' head, Judas chooses, it seems like Judas, at the very next moment, decides to betray Jesus, right? That's not a coincidence. Uh, it, so that suggests maybe the reason Judas betrayed Jesus was a financial reason, um, let's see. Uh, all right, there are some other reasons um, that Judas decides to betray Jesus that the church fathers and the saints thought of. If you include those in your answer, that's fine as well. But I, I just wanted to touch on those two. All right. Next one. Oh, why do the Jewish leaders want Jesus to be crucified? Um, well, some of the gospel writers suggest that it's because they're envious of Jesus. Um, some of them seem to think that, um, the Jewish leaders, I mean, think that Jesus really is committing the sin of blasphemy. And according to the Jewish law, anyone who blasphemes needs to be crucified. Um, Jesus has spent a lot of time criticizing the Jewish leaders, calling them hypocrites and things like that. Um, so it's a variety of reasons. Number 11. Why is Jesus silent in some of the trial scenes in the Passion narrative? So there's a couple reasons for this. Number one, uh, the Paschal Lamb 
connection, right? A lamb that's about to be sacrificed is silent. Lambs don't talk, right? They're meek. Um, so Jesus' connection with the Paschal Lamb is being established through his silence. Also because Jesus doesn't want to cause anyone to commit a sin. Remember, uh, this trial against Jesus is based on lies, right? Um, so if Jesus denies anything that uh, people are saying about him, right, they might double down and repeat their lie or dig in deeper, right? And Jesus is not going to uh, tempt anyone to commit a sin for any reason whatsoever, right? He's, this, he's God. God doesn't do that. Um, so, yeah, there we go. 11 questions. The next video will be about what to focus on when you're studying. See you later.